Hi again, this is the second video on the use of SQL and recursion to implement cellular automata. This time we will talk about this second kind of automaton in which the neighbors influence the cell C that we were always talking about. All right, so this will lead to a different type of simulation that we can express using the cellular automata and we will use this video to implement a liquid flow simulation. All right, so uh, just as a warning, I think this video comes with the most complex and the largest just re regarding the SQL source code query. So take your time to dig through the SQL code for this particular video. It's a bit more complex, a bit deep, more deeply nested than the other queries that we have discussed so far. It doesn't get deeper or more complex like this. If you can dig through this stuff, then you uh, can cope with everything that we will discuss in this particular course. Uh, and uh, well, we will take care to, uh, to dig slowly inside uh, the nesting of this particular query. I think the discuss discussion should be quite accessible. I, at least I hope so. All right. so. Uh, Let's remind us of the two types of cellular automata that we wanted to discuss in this lecture. We have already seen this type of automaton, which is of the game of life style, right? So there was some cell C and its fate was determined by the cells in its Moore neighborhood or in its neighborhood in general. The state of these cells determined the fate of the black cell in the next generation. In the type of CA that we will discuss now, we will look at this at, at, at this um, type of, uh, of automaton, where we assume that cells have an active role in influencing their neighbors. So this particular cell and this particular cell, they have an effect on their neighborhood. In this case, the arrows indicate that they have an effect on their Moore neighborhood, on their eight neighbors. Because this black cell has more than just two neighbors, uh, this neighbor and this neighbor, and also this, bot this top neighbor, um, let's focus a bit more, and also the neighbor uh, on top here to uh, the top left. Well, this cell, undergoes the influences of the eight of its Moore neighborhood neighbors. And uh, it's the task of the automaton to aggregate, to aggregate the influences um, carried out by all of these eight neighbors, uh, to aggregate these and apply these to this black cell. And well, these aggregated influences then determine the fate and the state of the black cell in the next generation. Okay. So our focus is on these other cells that uh, that influence their neighbors, and this uh, this leads to a different style of behavior encoding, a different style of the encoding of the dynamics of these CAs in SQL, as we will see. Okay. Uh, to make this more concrete, let's talk about a particular application of such CAs. And as I told you already, uh, this is all about the flow of liquid in a container. So we will, modi, uh, we will model such simple containers that contain of uh, exactly two ingredients of ground. So that's actually the container material itself. So that would be the ground that we model in this particular container, right? Okay, these are the light gray characters that I've used here. Okay, so this would be the container. The container might be regular, but they also might have bumps here. And uh, well, they might have any shape actually that we can model the with these uh, with these characters. Inside the container, you will find amounts of liquid that can be located somewhere or distributed somewhere in the container. So in this case, uh, in this initial state of this particular container, there is some liquid here on the right hand side of the container. And well, if this simulation has anything to do with our expected reality, then we probably expect that this fluid, this liquid 
will distribute itself from the right to the left here. It will probably cross the hump, then some of the liquid will be uh, gathered, uh, accumulated here in this particular compartment of the container. And uh, well, there should be some interesting uh, behavior going on, some liquid flows, some waves and so on that we should be able to, uh, to observe here. All of this uh, shall be modeled by this cellular automaton. And indeed a very simple model, as we will see, a very simple cellular automaton model is already sufficient to uh, model this quite interesting dynamic behavior of liquid in this container. All right. Uh, it's astonishing that, uh, well, an approximation of the reality of this liquid flow is already, uh, uh, is already uh, um, represented by just two very simple abstractions of energy that we will look at. So we will look at potential energy and kinetic energy or energy. So uh, the potential energy of such a, of such a column of water here would be just the this would be defined by the height of the column above the ground in uh, in this uh, in this x coordinate of the container. So we would have this column inside the container, and that column would consist of part ground and of part water or part liquid and the potential energy of this particular column of this particular x coordinate would be just the height of this line that I'm, draw I'm drawing here that's just the addition of the height of the container at this particular point and the height of the liquid column at this particular point so the potential energy energy at this x coordinate will be higher than the potential energy at this coordinate which will only be like this Okay, so that would be just the potential energy, energy, or, and uh, well, uh, this is just this simple formula. Of course, we will have a representation of the container and the current state of the water inside our uh, system. And well, ground at x plus water at x just refers to the height of the ground at coordinate x and the height of the water column at coordinate x. Very simple. Okay. So uh, this is one form of energy. And then the other form of energy would be kinetic energy. So we would assume that this column of water has already or has been moved here from the left to the right. And if it has come from the right, we assume that it will have the tendency to flow further to the left here. Okay, and likewise, if, uh, if this column of water has had impact from the left uh, we expect it to have some kinetic energy that will uh, that will lead us lead it to further flow to the right here so that would be the other form of energy that we are trying to model actually we will model this as just one value the kinetic energy at location at column x and if that value is uh, negative, then this will be a force that is oriented to the left. If it's positive, it will be oriented towards the right. I think this is all there is to say about this very simple, very simplistic physical system that we try to model. Just two uh, uh, kinds of material, ground and liquid, and just two very simple abstractive forms of energy, this potential energy and kinetic energy. And uh, just like in the game of life, a very simple setup like this is already sufficient to yield some very interesting dynamic behavior. This is actually the implementation or one sketch, one pseudo code sketch of the implementation of the cellular automaton that we are looking here, of the liquid flow cellular automaton. Uh, this is, in some sense, the replacement of the rules for the game of life cellular automaton, which uh, back then have been very simple rules like if this cell is alive in it and it has exactly three neighbors then the following state will be the cell is alive it's not that simple in this in this liquid flow cellular automaton but it's still simple enough okay so what this uh, run of the sequel li liquid flow simulation will try to well it will try to uh, we'll try to compute is in each of the runs here, this would be one iteration. All of this code would be considered one iteration of our cellular automaton. In one such iteration, it will compute an array of 
water changes. So at each x coordinate, this would be x coordinate one, x would be x coordinate two, this would be the x coordinate w. So for each of the x coordinate, we would compute in this iteration of the cellular automaton how the water column will change how will the height of the water column change well the height of the ground will not change the container the container will stay as is but the height of the water column may change in this iteration and this vector of exactly w entries from x equals 1 to x equals w will tell us how the water column changes at one particular x position it will also tell us about the kinetic energy, the kinetic energy that will be present at one particular x coordinate after the uh, computation has been performed. All right, uh, you see at this particular point when the iteration of the uh, of the uh, cellular automaton is done, when one such iteration has been performed, then we indeed use the water changes and the kinetic energy changes and apply them to the current state of our automaton. So <clears throat> these new water and kinetic value vectors, these would be the new state of our cellular automaton. Uh, when we've computed these, well, this is all we need to return to the top here and apply the next changes to the water and the kinetic energy in the next iteration. Okay, to compute these changes to the water and kinetic energy, we would just consider each column, each x-coordinate in our container from left to right. And for each of these x-coordinates, we would simply check whether the, the force that we see at one particular x-coordinate, if the force oriented to the left is larger than the force oriented to the right, just left of us. All right, so if at the current x-position, the force oriented to the left is larger than the force oriented to the right just left of us. That's why I'm talking about the position x minus 1 and x minus 1 here when I'm looking at the current potential energy and the kinetic energy. Well, if this is the case, then there will be liquid flow to the left. The force that is oriented to the left is 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 larger than the force that is oriented to the right. Well, there is this grass and lawn mowing going on. Let me quickly close the window of my office. All right, I'm sorry about that. Okay, all right. So if this is indeed the case, then there will be some liquid flow to the left. And uh, all of this conditional here, or the then branch of this conditional rather, this is concerned with the liquid flow to the left. First, we would con uh, compute how much water, how much water indeed flows from left, from right to left, from our current position to the position x minus 1 to the left of us. All right, so this is uh, the expression that would compute this flow, how much water would actually flow there. And uh, well, I would not discuss this particular uh, formula right now. It's, uh, it just makes sure that not all of the water is flowing uh, or not more of uh, than, uh, not, not more water is flowing than is indeed uh, present at our current position X. And then the differences between the forces, they determine how much water indeed flows. Then there is this dampening factor of one fourth here, which is a rather arbitrary factor that we have chosen to make the behavior of the system interesting. Uh, so uh, let's not dive into this formula here. It just computes the amount of water that flows from position x to position x minus one to the left. And that's what we are doing here we update the water changes uh, at position x minus 1 there will be more water now at our current position there will be less water all right and we also update the kinetic energy because the position to the left of us is hit by some water flow from the right its kinetic energy will be reduced there's also some dampening going on here but let's not focus on this too much so that would be flow to the left given that this predicate is true, there would be the following actions on our neighborhood. In this case, 
the neighborhood that is affected is the neighborhood to the left of us. So I'm only re repeating this here because uh, uh, I want to make sure that you see the pattern here. This is the influence of the position x on the position x minus 1 in our uh, container. Okay, of course, there would be more rules, very symmetric rules that, uh, that uh, accommodate a liquid flow to the right if the force that is directed to the right is larger than the force that is directed to the left just to the right of us. Okay, this would be just the mirror of the above code. All right, uh, so, but again, this would be a predicate that protects the evaluation of this particular code. And this particular code would compute our influence on our right neighbor, on the right-hand side neighbor. All right. So this is a very simple liquid flow simulation. Actually, it has been adapted from a discussion that I found on a subreddit that is indeed concerned with cellular automata. This is a treasure trove of interesting discussion on interesting experiments with cellular automata and what can be expressed with that. If you're interested in this, I would only encourage you to visit this particular subreddit at one point. All right, so this would be our liquid flow simulation. Uh, how could we transcribe this into SQL? Now comes the part where we, uh, where we dive deep in the particular SQL query that implements the behavior of the soil code that we've just seen on the previous slide. And because this is the most complex theory that we have uh, discussed so far, we will uh, introduce the query and explain the query going from the outside in. So we will look at the top level, at the outside of this particular query, and at this particular point, we will leave some details unexplored, some details that are actually not that interesting at this particular point. Later, on the following slides, we will zoom in on this diagon diagonal stripe part and then unravel all the details that you will find in here, but uh, that you will find here. But uh, at, this, at this particular point, all that's interesting uh, currently is seen on this slide. Okay, so uh, this would be the recursive CTE that we are using to implement the liquid flow simulation. And well, it would compute this four column table, right? And, uh, and in this, um, this four column table actually is, um, is formulated in, in a very general, in a general fashion. So this could not also, this could not only be applied to the liquid flow simulation, but this defines a cellular automaton of the second type of the influencing type for uh, two dimensional grids in which cells are located at some x, y position, uh, in which cells have a particular state, and in which, of course, we keep track of the iteration or the generation in which this uh, particular cellular automaton currently uh, is. Okay, so uh, let's see, how would we compute the next generation of uh, cells? Well, we would look at the current generation of cells and each of these cells we would uh, call C0. Okay, we would then perform a query that computes all the influences, the aggregated influences on the cell C0. Okay, so assume that this query that, inf that computes the influences on cell C0 is hidden behind this diagonally striped box here. We will not look in the details right now. But what comes out of this diagonal uh, uh, box is a three column relation. A three column relation says that says that the influence of all the other cells in our grid on position X and Y will be the following. The state, the state of the cell at uh, position X and Y has to be changed by delta dot delta state. This is the state change that will affect the cell at location X and Y. All right, so we will just make sure that the current cell C0 that we are talking about is indeed located at, at uh, locations X and Y. So we will, uh, we will perform this comparison here and we'll thus make sure 
that the state change that we are currently uh, looking at is indeed the state change that applies to cell C0. All right. Okay. If this is the case, then there's everything we need to compute the next generation of the cellular automaton is already there. Uh, well, we would uh, emit the next generation of cells, so we would increase the iter column here. All right. Of course, all of the cells would not change their position, right? So the X and Y coordinates of C0 will remain the same. This is just as in the game of life. The state of the C0 cell will, of course, change, right? This is the current state. And we will now apply the delta state change to this particular cell. Here you can see this is indeed the delta state change that has to be applied. We will use this particular operator to apply the state change. Uh, well, we will not further look into this operator. This could just be addition. It could be some complex user-defined function. This is just our abstraction of the application of state change. Okay, and that's all there is to it. There is one more complication here, and that says for most of the cells, for most of the cells, there will be no change from generation to generation. All right, so there might be some cells C0 that we won't find in this state change relation. Okay, so there will, no, there will be no joint partner regarding this condition for a particular cell C0. Still, we don't want, don't want to forget about cell C0. It shall be conserved unchanged in, be, will be uh, uh, copied unchanged into the new generation of our cellular automaton. And we make sure that this indeed happens by using this left outer join. All right. So in this left outer join, any cell C0 will indeed survive the join. Some cells that do not find a join partner will be will be matched with an aggregate state change of null. Okay. So ag dot x, x dot y, ag delta state will all be null in this particular case. All right. Okay, uh, so, but at least this cell C0 will be, uh, will be uh, conserved and will be part of the new generation. All right. So if ag delta state indeed is null, well, then this coalesce expression will not evaluate to null, but it will evaluate to this default value Z here. Okay. So this is our encoding of no state change happens. Okay, so whenever C0 is unaffected by the current state changes, we will apply a state change of Z here, and we expect Z to be the identity regarding this state change operator so that indeed C0 state will not change at all. This is what we are stating below here. Okay, so that would indeed be the top level of our cellular automaton. Only if we would be interested in more details here, we would need to zoom into the stripe box. And because we are interested in the interested in the details, let's zoom into the stripe box. Okay, so what you see here is a more focus, more focus on this iterated recursive query here. And you see what has been in the stripe box before is now this part of the query. Uh, this stripe box is the new inner core that we will now not look at right now, but only on the next slide. Okay, so you will probably recognize the left outer join that we've already seen on the previous slide. So what you can see here is a bit more detail in the uh, inside this stripe box. Well, we will compute the individual influences of all the cells in the grid on on uh, on the uh, on the uh, cell loca or grid location x y and the individual individual influences will be delta state all right so in general there will be more than one more than one influence on one particular position on the grid and each influence on this position of the grid will be of delta state all right to make sure that all 
all influences on one and the same position are actually being aggregated correctly because we want to apply aggregate state changes to our, to our cells, well, we would just uh, iterate over all these individual state changes, group by position, group by the x and y coordinates, all right, so inside one such group, we will now find all the state changes that are to be applied to one particular location in the grid. Oh, and then we would just aggregate. We would just aggregate all the state changes to find one aggregated state change. All right. And this aggregated state change is what we have talked about on the previous slide. So what you can see here is the transition from individual state changes to one aggregated state change for a particular location in the grid. Everything else remains the same. Okay, so inside this box here, inside this diagonal stripe box, we would now find code that uh, determines individual influences on one particular position x and y here. All right, so if we would like to learn about these uh, uh, details. Well, then we would switch to the next slide and zoom in a bit further. Okay, so this is now, this is now the piece of SQL code that was uh, inside the diagonal stripe box on the previous slide. So again, we can see a bit more of detail because we've zoomed in a bit more. Okay, so uh, what we will, what we will, uh, see here is uh, exactly our interpretation of the uh, of the uh, uh, cellular automaton in which a particular cell let's call it c1 influences its neighbors okay so we would iterate over all the cells call them c1 at this particular point right and uh, well what we would uh, what we would compute here in this box would be according to the rules of our cellular automaton. It would be all the influences, it would be all the influences that C1 has on its neighbors. Okay, so just to make sure that C1 can have influences on more than one neighbor, on, uh, well, maybe it's top neighbor, maybe it's right neighbor, maybe, I don't know, on many such neighbors, what we will uh, use here as a technique inside this box is to construct an array of influences. So that array can have zero entries, it can have one entries, it can have more entries, right? This will be an array of influences that C1 has on its neighbors. Okay, uh, once we have found this array of influences, this is the array of influences, well, we would just unnest this particular array. We would just unnest this particular array. This would give us this would give us individual rows of influences on individual posi positions in the cellular grid, and this is just the influences that we have talked about on the previous slide. All right. So, given a cell C one, compute the array of influences that it has on all its neighbors. Unnest that array to obtain a table of all the influences of all the influences that uh, that are um, applied to a particular position and a particular state change here. All right, so uh, this is actually, this is actually almost all the level of detail that we need here, right? Uh, what we, if we would zoom into the box even further, then we would reach the level of the true rules of the real cellular automaton that we are trying to implement here. What we find inside this box is truly specific to the uh, particular liquid flow simulation, heat flow simulation, or whatever traffic flow simulation, whatever we would like to encode using uh, our cellular automaton. What we have seen so far is really super generic. Okay, so if we now switch one more, the slide one more, once more, then, uh, well, what we then see is the stripe box. This is the content of the stripe box from the previous slide. And what you will see here is, uh, well, we, um, we look at all the cells C1. We look at all the cells C1 uh, and try to find out which are the cells that are being influenced by C1 and what that influence indeed is. All right. 
And as I told you, this inference would be encoded as an array, okay? And that array would be called influence. And you can indeed see how we are computing this particular array here. Well, uh, this in this follows very closely, actually follows the pseudo code that we have seen as we were talking about the liquid flow simulation. Uh, I hope you can recall that uh, the code took the form of, well, if a particular condition is fulfilled, uh, if the force to the left is larger than the force to the right, for example, so if a particular condition is fulfilled, then there is an impact, there is an impact on rows in the neighborhood of C1. So, for example, there would be an impact on the row just left to C1, or on the cell, I'm sorry, on the cell just left to C1. Or there could be another influence on the cell just above, or just below, I'm sorry, just below C1, right? And in these boxes, we would find a state change that would then be applied to the cell to the left of us or to the cell below us. Okay, if uh, there is more than one predicate to check, and this has been the case in a liquid flow simulation, there was flow to the left and flow to the right, if you recall, oh, then there could be a second predicate to check and a second array of uh, influences on uh, on other cells in the neighborhood. And uh, well, to, to concatenate and to aggregate all these changes where CI, C1 is uh, applying to the grid, we would just use array concatenation here. So that would be a part of change, array changes, that would be a, a, a array of changes. We would just concatenate them into one long influence array, which we will that, um, then pass to the rest of the computation. And of course, uh, to make sure that uh, this code can talk about the the neighborhood of cell C1 in uh, in uh, in convenient fashion, we could define windows like uh, the horizontal or vertical windows or uh, diagonal windows, any window that uh, would be suitable that would help to explore the neighborhood of C1 here. All right. Of course, also these predicates could uh, refer to these windows. Right uh, to uh, well, to compute Boolean conditions that uh, that only apply if we find certain certain uh, uh, scenarios or states in the neighborhood of cell C one. Okay, right. So I have chosen this particular style of SQL code to very close to very closely mimic the pseudo code that we have seen as we were talking about the liquid flow simulation. It's uh, testing of predicates. If the predicate is fulfilled, then collect an array of changes or influences on the neighbors. Okay, so that uh, admits a really straightforward transcription of the rules that you will often find in this particular format, if condition, then influence. Uh, this admits a very straightforward transcription of these rules into SQL. Okay, just to summarize how we, uh, to, how we uh, uh, compute these uh, uh, influences and then aggregate them, this is how the uh, influence data flow inside our, uh, inside our uh, cellular automaton actually is performed. First, we would uh, end up with individual arrays, with individual arrays of influences. So here's one particular cell C1 that yielded an array of length 2, an array of length 2, this would be one entry, and this would be one entry, so two influences on cells at location 1, 3, and cells at location 1, 4, and these influences would in this case simply be, well, integer state changes, so a plus 4 influence on the, on the cell at position 1, 3, and a minus 2 influence at the cell at position 1, 4. Right, so uh, our state type, the, the, the type of the state and all of the delta uh, state would be just integers. Right, another cell, another cell would also affect uh, its uh, neighborhood, and you see that this other cell would also impact the location 1, 3, it would deduct minus three there. And oh, there's another impact on the same uh, location and there would be a change of plus one there. 
All right, so each cell could influence its neighborhood and it would encode these changes inside these arrays. These arrays would then be unnested, okay? They would be unnested and group by position. This is how we arrive at this particular intermediate uh, table infs, influences. So uh, we would unnest the arrays. This is, has been done, so we are talking about individual rows here. And uh, these rows would be grouped by location. So all the influences on the position 1, 3, x equals 1, y equals 3, they would, would be collected in this particular group here. So three impacts on the location 1, 3. Yes, one such influence, second such influence, third such influence. All of them have been collected inside this group here. What we are left with then is to aggregate these state changes. And as you see, we simply assume that we use a summation aggregation in this super simple example on this slide here. So to compute the aggregated state change, simply sum up the delta state changes that are being applied to one particular grid location. So plus four minus three plus one, this is an aggregated state change of plus two on the location one comma three. All right, and this is what we see here. This would then be applied to this location in the current state of our cellular automaton to derive the next generation. Okay. Whew. Okay, so that would be the state influence uh, computation in our CA. If you followed all of this unraveling and diving deep into the nested query structure carefully, then you would probably see that what we've constructed there is a query of the following shape. Right, so once we unfold all these boxes and once we have the entire SQL template in front of us, then you would see that it indeed follows this form. All right, uh, well, we would, um, we would uh, compute over a recursive table T so our recursive uh, common table expression would indeed compute a recursive table T in our examples. This had, has been the table cells. Okay. Um, and if you unfold all the striped boxes, then we see that we end up with nonlinear recursion. The table cells is indeed mentioned twice. Cells as C0 and uh, cells as C1. This is the overall structure of our recursive query. And you, s you know that this is forbidden according to the SQL uh, syntactic restrictions on recursive CTEs. Bother. Okay, uh, but there's a way around that. There's a very simple way around that in many database systems. In PostgreSQL, it's particularly elegant and very simple. Uh, because this is indeed only a syntactic restriction and uh, not a semantic restriction as such, PostgreSQL is perfectly capable of evaluating nonlinear recursion just fine. We can work around the syntactic restriction in this similar fashion, in this simple fashion, I'm sorry. This is a long video already. Okay, so in this very simple session, uh, fashion, this would be the cur recursive table uh, T would be recursive table. We would just access. We would just access the contents of the recursive table, and rename that contents and call it T bar here. Okay. From the viewpoint of the syntactic analysis of PostgreSQL, T bar is not the recursive table. T is the recursive table. T is exactly mentioned once at this particular point. T bar is yet some other some other common table expression and uh, no such restrictions apply to t bar we can refer to t bar as often as we like and indeed in postgresql we can indeed we can use t bar here and uh, t bar here in the from clause and have a self join of t bar with itself we could mention t bar many times over, uh, over here uh, no problem at all. No syntactic problem anymore and also no semantic problem in PostgreSQL. So we could very easily express nonlinear recursion in this particular form. Uh, we could even use the name T here 
and uh, and and not need we would not need to invent a new name t bar at this particular point the scoping rules of postgresql uh, would uh, would say that this mention of t indeed refers to this newly defined t here and not to the recursive table and everything would be fine we would not even need to rephrase this particular query and rename the mentions of the recursive table very nice okay so some might regard this as the ugly hack some might regard this as an exposure that the syntactic restrictions that are currently implemented in postgresql and in other database systems in the sql standard actually are bogus and should be on the table for a discussion and maybe should be these restrictions should be weakened or even removed okay so if you uh, look at the complete sql template that we've constructed now you probably have a hard time to uh, read this in the video. I don't know about the resolution. Maybe it's readable, but uh, well, of course you will find one instance of this particular template. You will find it in the SQL file that I'm distributing in the repository. So don't uh, so don't bother to read this. It's just too small. Uh, but uh, well, this is this is the structure of the query that we have constructed. Uh, it's actually not too complicated. Um, some commentary on the right hand side that uh, shows you indeed what's going on um, I think it's time I think it's time to look at one concrete instantiation of uh, of this template for the case of our liquid flow uh, that would be uh, one part of this instantiation for our liquid flow simulation the entire code is found over in the terminal and I switch over in a second what you will then see there is a very nice a very nice liquid flow simulation that should look like this uh, well uh, if you look at the container in its state zero we have seen the distribution of water inside the container at state zero on a previous slide in 25 iterations later 25 iterations later indeed we can see that the water has distributed to the left here and this part has some substantial kinetic energy because it was moving from the right here and it will continue to flow to the left and you can indeed can see this in iteration 50 of the uh, of the automaton indeed there's a wave here that has um that has reached the left hand side compartment of the container and liquid is indeed aggregating here inside this compartment then the wave is actually flowing back to the right hand side of the container this is iteration 100 in 125 the wave has come back and uh, will hit this uh, this wall or this hump again in the container and so on you will see a back and forth of the wave in this container and at one particular point there will be actually a stable situation where everything has come to rest and we just see some uh, very slight waves going from left to right here and water has been distributed in the container as we would have probably expected it in real life all of this made possible by this very simple liquid flow simulation that we have implemented in sql well and that we have indeed implemented it like we've shown here let me prove that to you by switching over to the terminal there we go all right uh, yeah so this is our sql implementation of the whole idea what we would start uh, with again is very very similar to the game of life setup we would uh, first define the initial world the initial state of the container and the liquid the the water that we have distributed in the container so let's uh, create a table that can hold this in this initial world and uh, this initial world well we've uh, we've prepared these table inputs here that allow us to specify these initial worlds again in a text-based line-by-line based row-based fashion that is easy to look at easy to edit and easy to play with you see i've uh, i've uh, prepared some initial containers or initial worlds here i think one of these should be active yes so this is a nice container it's just this uh, regular container and 
well a column of water or column of liquid in the center of this container and well my experience tells me that this water should distribute to the left and to the right and some waves should be going on here so let's uh, prepare this input okay uh, there's more here. There's even the container that we've already seen on the slides. Uh, we can play with this and see this is the input that we've now defined. Okay, uh, this input will be converted into a form that we can easily operate over. This will be this form of a table of three, of three columns. This is just the form that we described on the slides. At a particular x coordinate, there will be some ground of the container, and above that ground, there will be water. All right, so let's transform the input into this form. Okay, and then look at this encoded form. Well, yeah, so the container indeed has a width of 24 columns. 24, right, okay. Uh, this is the height of the ground in this particular on the, in these particular columns. So at the very left and at the very right hand side, the height of the ground is 80. That would be the borders, the walls of the container. And in the middle of the container, well, the walls would only or the, the ground is only a height of eight. So that would be just the bottom of the container. Okay water is only found in the middle of the container this is the column of water that we have been looking at in the sample input here this is the column of water of height 72 in the middle of the container okay so this is indeed uh, an encoding just like we've seen on the slide uh, seen on the slides of the initial world okay so now it's time to start the simulation uh, what has been called cells on the uh, on the slides all the time is called zim here for this particular instantiation of the SQL template. Of course, you will see the ingredients that we've already discussed, the iteration uh, column, and then the encoding of the location of the particular cell. In this case, it's just the X location of the uh, of the column of water. Uh, and then the ground and water, the height of the ground and the height of the water column at the particular position X, and the kinetic energy at, energy at position X. That's all we need. These mark the state. These mark the state of the, uh, of the current position X. Actually, it's only these two columns that mark the state because ground will be static and stable and not change. Okay, so the initial state is just the state of the initial world, and we would in incorporate that as iteration zero and then we would start our simulation here what you can see is our syntactic hack the recursive table sim would just be called sim here and uh, from now on we can refer to this non-recursive name sim uh, many times as many times as we need in our template here here you see one occurrence of sim and later down you will see a second occurrence of sim so safe recursion here but uh, no problem at all okay all of the other bits and pieces have just been filled into the sql templates that you've already seen on the slides okay well this is quite the query already uh, we will perform 300 iterations before we stop this uh, recursive common table expressions in bag semantics right and uh, well at the uh, at the end of the simulation we will just dump the whole iter uh, simulation result here, uh, ordered by iteration and then by X column. All right, so I think let's do that. Okay, and that's about it. It took like 1,3 seconds to perform 300 iterations of our liquid flow simulations. What you don't see is any output result here. That's only because uh, I used the output of the recursive common table expression to define this temporary table simulation. So indeed, of dumping all the output on us, I saved the output of the recursive CTE into the simulation table. And I can now look at the simulation table at will. For example, I could look at the first 100 rows that have been collected there. Let's uh, have a quick look at that. Okay, we see that uh, 
Yeah, there is indeed uh, uh, s the state of the of the container in iteration zero is just the state of the initial world that we have defined. So there is nothing to see here. Already in in uh, in iteration one, there has been some changes to the middle column of water here. You see that stuff has been distributed to the right, uh, okay, and to the left as well in symmetric fashion. I think this is what we would expect. Water is expected to flow to the left and right in symmetric fashion from this middle column. And this will only continue if we look at further iterations. This is iteration two. And you see that uh, some more distribution of water to the left and right has been performed. Only the very middle of the column is unaffected still. But I think, uh, yeah, well, in iteration three, well, water has distributed further and all of the column is in movement now. And this will only continue with iteration four, five, up to 300 here. Okay, so nobody can parse this numeric data. Luckily, I've prepared some simulation, some visualization for you to see how the liquid flow indeed happens inside this simulated system. So what I'm trying to do now is to export the contents of the simulation table into a CSV file. I will do that. Okay. And then I will switch over to my terminal here where I've got a Python file where I've got a Python script that will read the CSV file. The CSV file will contain the state of the uh, simulation uh, in iteration 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 300 in all of these 301 iterations. And the Python file will read the CSV output and from that generate uh, well, a simple ASCII-based rendering of the contents of the container here in the terminal. So let's see. You see, I'm reading the CSV file that has just been written by PostgreSQL. I'm starting my Python script here. And what we will see is the iteration zero of our initial world, indeed the container with the middle water column. So if I press enter now, the iteration, the simulation should, uh, should be animated here. Let's see how this goes with the laptop that encodes video data at the same time. But uh, oh yeah, it's not too bad. All right, so this is the behavior of the water here. Uh, we will see after iteration 300, maybe even earlier than that, there will be there will be a stable system and not much is going on at iteration 300 inside this water container. Nice. Okay, so let's see how things are going with uh, another world, another container. All right, so now that we have uncommented this particular container, uh, well, let's save that and then switch over to the terminal again and just run the query again. Uh, so P sql, all right, so the fluid one-dimensional simulation shall be run. Okay. And uh, well, we could just animate again. Uh, the new CSV file has been written. This will be a run of the new simulation. Indeed, we see the new container, the one that we've seen on the slide. And simulating that shows the behavior that we expected. The left compartment is filled with water. There is some wavy stuff going on on the right-hand side. This is just the behavior of the liquid that we expected. All being simulated by, well, the simple uh, CA that we've implemented in SQL. All right. I hope that you could enjoy it. Uh, can, could you enjoy that? All right. Uh, I hope that you like this particular example. I know that the involved query has been a bit more complex this time, I, but I think it has been worth it. And uh, well, as I told you, it won't get more complicated from here on. All right. So uh, I think there is one more use case left, one more use case left in our discussion of recursion in SQL, and uh, it will be about a completely different topic again. I hope you'll be around when we close our discussion on recursion in the upcoming video. So uh, hope to see you then. Bye.